Welcome to Changelog, where we explore the latest updates, enhancements, and changes to New Relic itself. In each episode, we dig into the new features and functionalities as told by the people who envisioned, shaped, and even coded them. We discuss the inspiration and the data behind the development, as well as common use cases and applications. I'm Leon Adato, one of the New Relic DevRel advocates, and joining me this week is dun -da -da, Yara Mireles, back again! Welcome! Thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me back. And also, Jonathan Karen, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Leon. It's great to be here. So uh, I know that we have a lot to talk about exciting things, but we are not just talking heads. We are real people who have real lives that we like to do different things. So I want to just give you a chance to introduce yourself, what your title at New Relic is, and just some of the things that are exciting in your life. Um, Jonathan, as the new guest on Changelog, go ahead and I'm going to make you go first. Awesome. Uh, hello, I'm Jonathan. I am the Senior Director of Security Products here at New Relic. Uh, I have been at New Relic for over a decade, so I've got my grubby fingerprints over all sorts of different product here. And uh, gosh, what's going on in my, my life? I have decided to celebrate getting old and being at New Relic for 10 years by joining a team relay race uh, in June that I'm now starting to train for. I'm gonna have to run about 25 miles over the course of 36 hours along with 11 other completely ludicrous people. <laughs> I was gonna, better you than me on every day of the week. Wow, that is, uh, good luck with that. Thank I hope you, that thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay, Yoram, uh, what is your title today? Because I think it's different from the last time you were on here. And it what's is. new and new and exciting? So I became a director of product marketing. Thank you. Give the applause. Um, I take care. Thank you. Thank you. I take care of uh, vulnerability management. One of my many responsibilities here at New Relic. I joined last year. I enjoy every minute of it. It's insanely fast paced, but I love it. Uh, I'm not going to try to follow the insane marathon that you have going on. <laughs> I should mention this. I did run a half marathon not too long ago, two, three years ago. And um, I did horribly and it was bad and I almost died. So good luck with that. <laughs> He's I still recovering, so <laughs> right? Right. You can feel the support, the support from the side. Like we're going to be yes. over there, you know, drinking a beer like, yeah, you go. All right. That's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we do have to do some some work here. Uh, so I, I just imagine that, you know, for a lot of the audience, they're sitting, you know, let's just say that they're a dev and they're sitting at their devy little desk doing their devy little things. And then the security team comes and drops a steaming fresh pile of discoveries on their desk, you know, problems with the code or with the platform or whatever. And now they have to make this decision. They can either stop all the dev work to fix these things, which will completely piss off the business because it, it you know, ruins velocity and also might, you know, make them miss their bonus because they miss their targets. Or they can ignore the security stuff, which I will say, spoiler alert, is never a good idea. But they can ignore the security stuff and risk having a security breach and also that would piss off the business and probably lose them their job. So I'm not saying that, you know, security breaches that hit the news almost daily aren't important, but it's clear that there's a flaw in the open source library. It's clear that, that a flaw in the open source libraries that we rely on puts our missions and systems at risk or potential risk. But the idea of who is responsible for fixing those issues, for being aware of those issues, has changed. And I'm not exactly sure it's scalable or reasonable the way that things operate today. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that diatribe, because it took a long time to think up that whole thing about Debbie Little Desk and things like that. So I love Debbie Little Desk. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So where does that put us? Well, you know, I would... I would add to that scenario a little bit, right? The thing running through your mind is, I wish someone had told me sooner, or how serious is this really? Yes. Or is this really exploitable? Or, oh, wow, uh, I need to go and talk to some other people, right? And, <laughs> and all of those are, to me, they're problems with the process and the tooling that we have in place for this stuff today. Yeah. So, and, and also another way to think about this is the, the 
Reliability management and risk assessment is, is always been uh, top of mind for the last past 20 years. It's not new. Uh, but now with the chief left uh, responsibility that everybody has within the organization when it comes to uh, software development and maintaining that software alive, um, we now can kind of shift into thinking of this vulnerability management and risk assessment activity, not as a, a pile, as a, this pile of things that they just landed on my desk. We need to take a look at the um, compliance point of view when it comes to paying technical debt. At the end of the day, uh, it's something that is at risk, it's open, and we need to just go and close it. So it's just technical debt. It's, it's just a fancy name to, to pay that, uh, that debt forward. Yeah, and I would I would add to that, Yoram, uh, not to cut you off, Leon, um, no, but I no, did. Good. Um, you're the guest. That's what you're you doing. <laughs> I've more and more come to think of vulnerability management as just part of software quality. You know, we have we have availability SLAs that we're accountable for. We have bug SLAs. We have quality metrics, reliability, performance, right? All of this stuff. And, you know, making sure our software is secure is just another part of that. So really what I'm interested in seeing is how do we shift our thinking from like, hey, let's just throw some tools at the app owning teams and the devs and let them figure this out to, you know, how do we learn from what we've learned with, you know, site reliability engineering with platform operations teams uh, with, you know, working with support teams on delivering a great customer experience in the face of bugs, right? It's all trade-offs and priorities, and there's only so much time you have in a week. So I want to get better at just looking at security, looking at vulnerability issues right alongside all those other tasks that we've got every day. Okay, I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit, and, and I'm going to speak for the devs. You know, I'm... Uh... You know, I'm, I'm going to be that guy. I speak for the devs who are out there trying to make a just an honest living. So, the you know why why are the devs on the line to do the work though? I mean, I again, security is everyone's concern, but I, there's still this trade off, and when you have to make an individual dev have to judge, not without a whole lot of insight between continuing the forward motion and the velocity and going back and fixing something, which to your point, Jonathan, was, you know, like, I don't know, maybe it matters. It's a lot of responsibility to put on each individual when, you know, they got to fix the bugs also and they have to do, they have to do this, all this stuff. Like, how do we make that process easier? Yeah, I, I think this is why over the last five odd years, we've seen this idea of shift left take hold, right? Like, if only we could take these security tools and just have the output show up in the devs work instead of in the security team, they would know faster and, you know, sooner if they were causing problems. The problem with that is that it doesn't work, just like asking developers to run a production, you know, web app at scale doesn't work. Because you've got right. too many things you've got to juggle, right? And on the flip side, you know, you asked, like, why, why is it the dev's job? Well, they're the ones who can fix vulnerability flaws, right? You don't want a security engineer or an ops person coming in and changing code, rebuilding an app and, and deploying it. Like, that's not... Fair. <laughs> right. That's going to yeah. cause just as much trouble. Um, so, you know, where, where we've been thinking about it is, is really trending towards how do we get all these folks to work together to be, to synthesize the data from all these different security tools that you've got to use, even just for vulnerability management, you know, you've got flaws in your source code, you've got flaws in third party libraries, you've got cloud resources that are provisioned, you've got, you know, network permissions and virtual private clouds and on premise, all this infrastructure and all this stuff going on. And someone has to untangle all that and figure out which parts go where and who owns what and how high priority is it versus all the other security work. And then how high priority is that versus your feature work and your reliability work. And to add to that, it's that you have this big budget spent on, on uh, threat detection and 
really at the front of the house when it comes to preventing uh, critical incidents and breaches. But then once you discover that breach, it has to go back to the people who can actually fix it, which is the, develop the developer. You don't want, you don't want uh, security people touching that code. Um, who knows what's going to happen after that? So <laughs> we're, we're going to we're going to try to just shift that perspective into the other teams so they can participate into the same security practice, uh, rather than getting into this loop of tossing the ball back and forward so they can fix it. Right, and, and I think there's also there's another piece of it which, when when this gets discussed by pundits or by people giving a conference talk, they say, you know, that, you know, it should be, there should be a tool that detects the, the, the issue, it alerts the developer, the developer, you know, does the hard work of fixing it, and then we're all happy. No, sometimes it's iterative. Sometimes the developer does a thing, it doesn't really fix the problem or doesn't fix the entire problem because, you know, there's another vulnerability, a different flaw, a different aspect of it or whatever. Sometimes there's a back and forth that I think we gloss over too easily, which is that feedback loop is often incredibly manual, right? Like, you know, the, the security team says there's a there's an issue with this library. OK, fine. I will, you know, update the library. Done. No, it's not done. It may be that your performance was hit. It may be that the, you know, the, the flaw persisted in the next version of the library. It may be that now you have to, you know, you have that cascade of updating other things and you've introduced a different flaw. And unless you have a constant, you know, way of understanding how every fix, did it really fix the problem? Did it really do it? Then you end up just continually, you know, picking one thing up and dropping another thing. It seems like yeah. No, and let me expand a little bit. I'm going to latch on to the library situation. Mm -hmm. uh, what do, do we even know which libraries have this vulnerability? Where are they deployed? Where do they live? Um, the, the, we are currently sort of reactive when it comes to shift left and security. That, yeah, we toss the problem that we found uh, to the other end, and then they fix that particular thing so they don't lose their bonus uh, <laughs> and continue the velocity. But they, they, they don't know where this library is present within the environment many times. So here in Relic, we try to uh, fix that problem for, for the, our developers, for the developer teams and for the security teams. So when they find something, they know exactly where it is and how to find it, and then go and address it, right? Because it's, it's, instead, it's an exercising of, of ping pong going back and forth. Sure. So yeah. it sounds, oh, I, John, I'll, go ahead. I think the other thing is, in shift left, which, you know, I have all sorts of problems with that term, uh, I'll be honest, but it is one of the things we talk about. We've, we've conflated a couple of things. One of those is shifting the responsibility for interpreting scan results and doing the work onto dev teams with less support from security. And the other is shifting earlier in the development cycle, right? And, and there's absolutely gains to be had by scanning your source code every time you open a pull request or merge some code or build a new artifact, right? You want to be catching security problems early and often. You can fix them. It's way cheaper to do that than to let something get into production and then a month later discover you've got a problem and now you have to like book time to go through an entire release process to fix that. But that doesn't completely solve the problem, right? Because, you know, to the, the open source issue, there are bugs in those libraries that we don't know about today. And so if I've got, you know, a library that we use in a lot of our microservices and suddenly there's a new zero day disclosed for that, mm -hmm. how do I how do I address that? For one thing, I've got to go and figure out what is all the software that's actually impacted by that. And, you know, in a shift left world, that involves going to your source code repos on GitHub or wherever and actually searching through them, trying to figure out all the dependency files, who's got that dependency. Then you have to rescan all of those repos to see, are we actually like using a version that's impacted or not? And that takes a bunch of time and babysitting. And then you have to make sure they all get documented and patched and built and QA'd and then deployed. And then you have to track all the deployments and say, well, do we actually know where this software was running you know in in mm -hmm. a really great modern well-tuned continuous deployment environment we may know where like 90 percent of that stuff is 
But I guarantee you, even in that modern world, like there's a couple containers floating around somewhere in some region that just didn't get redeployed at some point. Right. Right. And, Not to mention the fact and, that, you know, for the three companies you just identified, you know, they're probably OK. But for the rest of us who are dealing yeah. in the real world, you know, the not modern CICD 300, you know, uh, you know, pushes to production a day like, eh, you know, yeah, you've, like got you've got VMs other stuff going on. No one has touched in a year. Right. Yeah. Everyone. I mean, almost everyone does. And that stuff's you and that's where i think what the way we're thinking about this with more observability based practice putting all the data in one place making sure everyone has access to the same information letting you query it along different dimensions and look you know they talk about defense in depth for security from a, a threat protection perspective but there's also defense in depth across the development life cycle where yes i want to be scanning and assessing risks in my source code, in my config as code, all of that. But I also need tools actually checking the real production world and being able to compare and contrast between those so that we, we can actually be confident we've fixed the problem, which saves every dev time, right? Because once you right. know, I have fixed that bug, I have fixed that outage, you can move on with your life as opposed to getting a note a day later saying, actually, Hang on, let's go back and do it yet again. Yeah. Right. Let me, yeah, let me put a little bit of a, like real terms what we're talking about here. So let me talk about the um, boogeyman from last year, Log4j. That, that thing's still out there. Someone's going to bring it up. Someone's yeah. going to, yeah. It's, it's, gonna, it's only one of us. I mean, you know. Right. It, it's still out there. After a year, uh, I think uh, one of the news outlets, uh, the specializes in tech, I won't say any names, uh, just put an article out uh, saying that Look for Jay still very much present out there. Okay, the SQL wild. Slammer is still out there, so you know, of course it is. <laughs> but but they don't know where it is. Where how to find it? So so these all these practices that Jonathan just described become like incredibly important uh, because the critical vulnerabilities are not the ones being exploited statistically. Is the mediums and lows yeah. who gets exploited most of the time by bad actors. It's, it's not the front page uh, news type of deal. It's, it's the one that linger, that get exploited over and over and over again. And Log4j is kind of one of those. And yes, somebody had to go there. Right, exactly. You had to. So clearly what I'm hearing from both of you is that New Relic has a very specific angle on how to approach this. And uh, I know, you know, we've got, first of all, we... We collect data. We're a data company. That's what we do. You know, we just sort of collect it all like Pokemon. So how do we take our observability pedigree and apply it to something like, you know, vulnerability management? What do we, how do we do that? What's our, what's our take on it? Uh, we understand where all the data is coming from because we take a look at the environment end to end. Uh, we understand where all the libraries live and what the exposures are, because we can correlate that with the telemetry we, we collect. And we have unprecedented visibility end-to-end -end, uh, from when it comes to the tech stack, uh, because observability is the most well-positioned practice to take a look at this problem head on. So uh, we, we uh, put some things together, one plus one equals three, and now we have new relic reliability management, which is Jonathan can and highlight on all the all the goodness that we baked into uh, to help our the developers and the security teams uh, do their best job. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for framing it up, Jorn. Um, yeah. You know, I think there are a couple of tenets that drive our product strategy here and drive the way New Relic is thinking about vulnerability management. Um, one is that we're really trying to stay away from all of those super finely sliced acronym based, you know, security tool yeah. sub markets. Like there's like 30 of them, right? And we're really trying to stay away from saying, oh, we got to build a this, we got to build a that, we got to build one of those. Um, instead, what we've done is we've really just stepped back and said, you know, there are two fundamental jobs to do in security when it comes to, you know, the application, the business apps, the folks who are in our world of New Relic. One is, you know, you need to proactively manage the risk of your software and your, your applications, you know, software kind of broadly speaking, including infrastructure, including cloud, all that stuff. 
you need to proactively manage that risk, which means you need to be running assessment tools, generating findings, looking at them, prioritizing the right preemptive proactive work so that you're more secure and carrying less risk in the most important places. And there's a whole ton of really interesting security world thinking on like, what do we mean by risk-based vulnerability management? How do we implement those kind of practices? The second job to be done is, you know, detect and respond to attacks. Like, have we been hacked? Are we looking at indicators of compromise? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? What do we do when we suddenly realize our database is, you know, returning 500 rows when it used to return one row for every query? Or we find out there's a, you know, a network connection to a command and control server that's exfiltrating data. I, I look at those as two very different practices. Typically, there's a different part of the InfoSec team solving each of those. Proactive work tends to be devs and DevOps and SREs. Reactive work tends to pull in sysadmins and IT operations, you know, as needed for the investigation. But it's just, they're super different spaces. So we're focused on the proactive part, on the vulnerability management part with this product. And the second, you know, really strong principle here is that it is a team sport. We're not going to get rid of security engineers and AppSec specialists. And, and even like, you know, you may have like an architect whose second job is make sure our applications and software are secure so that our central InfoSec team doesn't come to us with a bunch of, of work to do every quarter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, you see a lot of that, just like SREs, you see a lot of that sort of multiple different people trying to make sure that we're on top of security so that it doesn't become a big fight between a couple of execs in the company. Um, and they're not sitting there spending their time debating what percent of the org's time is spent on security patching. Like if the, you know, if the engineering team mm -hmm. gets good enough at it, if, you know, even thinking about CVEs and like, are we actually impacted by this? Like if we get good enough at routinely updating those third-party dependencies and staying on top of that, we're going to carry less bugs. It's going to be easier for us to re-architect and refactor, and it's going to be super easy to fix the vast majority of these security bugs. Because usually, you know, anytime a really big flaw in an open source library comes out, there's going to be point releases, right? You're not going to have yeah. to upgrade to a new major version as long as you've been kind of keeping up with, you know, mainstream development over time. So again, yeah. it kind of gets back to like, we just have to be fluent at this task of maintaining our software, just like we have to be fluent at testing and deploying smoothly and all that other stuff. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of, you know, that thinking has informed the way we've approached the product. The other one, I'll stop rambling, I swear, is- It's good stuff. No, good like stuff. security is not a single vendor problem. Right. No one just goes all in on a single security vendor and never looks at other tools from other vendors. You know, you, you like even if you're looking for a great platform, there's still places where you're going to say we have a gap in our coverage. We need a tool for this. Our preferred vendor doesn't have one. Let's go find someone great at this. And so a lot of what we've done within New Relic is invested in building a platform where we can bring in that third party data from any security assessment tool that can identify vulnerabilities and findings, normalize it and treat it like first class information in our UI. So you don't just have a bunch of findings from a bunch of different tools dumped in a database, you actually have workflow that understands the difference between a finding on a cloud resource or a VM or a bare metal host or a software application. And, and we've built the product in a way to help you reason about all of that and sift through and sort and find the most important nuggets in all that information. Yeah. So to add a little bit of, the, of perspective from, from the practitioner uh, side, we, we understand that the compliance is it's viewed as this activity that everybody hates. It's a, it's a compliance related issue. It's something like, oh, you have to do a limit manager. Oh, gosh. Everybody's kind of bummed about it. Uh, we are here in New Relic with our perspective uh, in, in the capability that we possess and observability. We try to move that away from, from being uh, this thing that everybody hates to do to a practice that the daily engineer just builds into their 
into their velocity. So um, I think it's best if uh, John, you can you can show them what what do we mean. Yeah. I was ready for a demo like two minutes ago. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Let's 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 take Go a look at this. It. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I could talk about this for like an hour because I love this product and I think it's super cool. But there's a few things I want to highlight that I think kind of tie back to what we've been talking about. One is pulling security data into context and making you aware as you're going about your day that there are top of mind issues you should be paying attention to without, you know, flashing giant banners and, you know, sending <laughs> you chat messages all day long. Uh -huh. So one of the things we've done, you know, hopefully most of our, our viewers are familiar with, you know, our APM over summary screen here. <laughs> um, you'll see in the top right that we've added just a little widget here that if we detect critical vulnerabilities in a service, we're just going to put up a little, you know, kind of pink notification here and say, hey, You've got two unpatched critical vulnerabilities. You should fix those. And I can click on fix vulnerabilities and I'm immediately taken in to see the actual vulnerabilities that are impacting this specific service right now. And in this case, this is a demo app and you can see that it's been sitting idle because we've got a bunch of stuff that's been sitting here for about five months. It's still being detected uh, as of yesterday. And, you know, I've got a bunch of CVEs here and I can click in, I can say, oh, this is like, you know, some kind of shell escape sequence. What is this? Oh, this is a Ruby app. It's in rack. And just with that two clicks, now I'm looking at one of the top vulnerabilities impacting this app. I get a nice description, which is mm. coming from the, you know, NIST um, CVE database. So this is, you know, standard security content. But then we're doing some intelligence here and providing both a little more help for you as a developer and some observability principles here. So we're gonna tell you that there are versions of this library you can upgrade to uh, that will fix this. And in this case, you know, it looks like there's a point release on three different um, minor versions of the Rack library. Uh, in this case, we're actually getting this data both from New Relic's APM agent as well as from GitHub Dependabot, which we're using to scan the source code. So this is an issue that's being detected across both of those, you know, both the, the runtime service as well as the source code. So I can tell that no one has patched this upstream, right? And like in some cases they patched it and you're just waiting for a deploy. That's great to know the difference because you can be more confident that something's going to get deployed once you see activity in the source repo and things are getting fixed. And then down here, if I look at this and say, gosh, this is, you know, maybe this is actually a really important vulnerability for us as a team, as a company to focus on, right here I can see every service that is impacted by this vulnerability. So what we're doing is we're looking at the libraries used by every application that New Relic is monitoring and pulling up just a list of, hey, here's a whole bunch of other apps that are using a version of Rack that is impacted. And we've got uh, support for pulling in tags as well, right? So if you're tagging all of your entities in New Relic with things like, is this the production environment or the QA environment, which team owns this? We can actually pull those in line here and you get a, you know, a better view of, okay, I've got to go talk to the packaging team, the logistics team, the order management folks have a ton of stuff here. Mm -hmm. And this is really meant to help you apply the investment you've made in good observability to your security work. Nice. So that's, you know, that's the in context part, right? That makes me as a developer feel a little more like I know what the current issues are. If I fix an issue, it goes away from that list and I don't have to focus on it anymore automatically. Um, but it also allows a security team to come in and inject findings from other tools straight into the runtime services so that I notice them. Right, so we've got an open API, you can plug in other scanning tools, you can send your own data. Uh, you know, some, some companies that I've talked to have already invested a bunch in curating the list of top priorities. And they said, we really just wanna send what we consider the critical issues over to the dev teams. Because otherwise we're flooding them with too much stuff and they just reject the work. So what they can do is 
once they've processed and triaged and decided on what are the top priorities, they can use our API to just inject a select set of vulnerabilities into the new Relic product experience, right? And so it's like right. now you don't have to go track down the service as a security engineer and figure out who owns it and file the ticket and everything. Like you can, you can use New Relic to route and get that information in front of the right people. Right, and triage was the word I was going to use. Is that you know having having that filtration system so that people are only hearing about the things that they that they can deal with. I mean, we're talking about you know the devs are only as if they are a single monolithic group. But to your point about tagging, there's different app teams, and there are different you know group groups within groups of people who handle the whether it's the front end back end kind of thing or it's just these are the people who are really good at security so we're going to have a tag we're going to have a, a custom attribute that specifies this goes to the security SWAT team within the front end customer facing application or you know app team or whatever so you know again the triage and the the thoughtful routing of things makes a huge difference i i would think yeah, absolutely. And that's where, you know, we, so we, we thought, okay, as a developer, what's the best way to get you this information? And one way is like in context, just I'm cruising around in New Relic and help me become aware that a specific component, a specific entity has an issue. But you also want a top-down view, right? You want to be able to come in and say, what does my security posture look like overall? And that's where, you know, in the left nav of New Relic, there's now a vulnerability management tab. And if I click on that, I get a summary of everything. And you can see right here, we've integrated data from AWS Security Hub. So we know if there's cloud config problems. We've integrated GitHub Dependabot. And I get a single summary of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I can immediately see, you know, how many critical and high, and, and we hide other by default. We hide the, the mediums and the lows. Um, cause a lot of people just said, Hey, we, we just really don't want that stuff in front of us every day cause it's too much. Uh, but you can reveal that as well. And then we'll calculate some vanity stats for you. Like, you know, how old are the issues that haven't been resolved? How many days on average is it taking you to remediate issues that are detected? You know, how many issues are being assigned or closed out? How many entities are impacted by, you know, different severities of issues all in one place. And the super powerful thing about this that you were just talking about is this is all New Relic platform aware, entity aware. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I just want to see my team's dashboard, um, I can filter by one of these teams. I can filter by the e-commerce team. And they've got no problems right here. They've got the day off. They're, They're good. They're killing it. They're doing yes. great, right? <laughs> guys are amazing i, I want to latch on into something that that you just mentioned i, I think it's important to highlight you you said this is these are vanity metrics but when you go in front of the cio ceo and uh you are kind of the head of of security even even if you're working with the on the developer side and then they sit down on the on the desk and say okay how am i more secure than yesterday um everybody kind of looks around the room and then they kind of answer now with this <laughs> Quote, unquote, vanity metrics absolutely can point to that and like, see, yesterday we were here, now we're here, progress. And, and right. it's something very, very valuable for organizations, especially the enterprise, uh, where they can just really measure the progress that they're doing when it comes to risk management. So it's, it's very powerful stuff. And I'll speak from the other side of it, which is, you know, I'm I'm usually the 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 person in the room who's screaming, you know, but but you haven't let us, you you haven't enabled us to do the fixes that we need to do. Why aren't you giving, you know? Well, it's not really that bad, you know. I haven't seen anything. So on the other side of it, to say, look, we were at this very low place a month ago or last quarter, and now because we've left it alone and we haven't touched it, and we haven't put the investment of time to refactor and to take, you know, to to go back and squash look where. Where we are now and you know seeing that line going up is a, a nice little wake-up call again not a vanity metric it is a way yeah. of justifying of making your case from a business standpoint to get the the time to focus to get the story points allocated to get you know however you want to put it it's you know to be able to to go do what needs to be done another thing i want to highlight from this view uh is is the fact that when you sit down and talk to a cio and, and 
you're in the same team, uh, in the same room with other teams. Uh, the security side, for example, might point out to the fact that I have this collection of three things that tells me that I'm, I'm doing I'm doing great, right, on the security side. But on the developer side, it's like, well, I, I, I see I have to address this critical thing, so I'm not doing that great. Uh, New Relic, with the open uh, platform that it is, they can bring that data in and it normalizes. So everybody speaks the same language, everybody yeah. has the same metrics, mm -hmm. and there is no more arguing on, but my tool says this, now yours, is that, that goes away. It's, everybody's on the same page, everybody's on the same pane of glass, and they can agree on, 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 on the critical issues so they can go after them first. Uh, or, or not, it, it depends on the, on the risk assessment that they have to do. But it, 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 they now have a single place where they can bring everything together and then make the informed decision that they need to make. Cool. Yeah. Is there? So let me let me show you something else. I was going to say, is there more? Is there <laughs> oh, more? I want to see more. Yeah. More. <laughs> you know, like to your point, everyone. I mean, it makes me feel really good when there's like a decent looking burn down chart. And you're like, hey, we're getting ahead of this work, right? We started with a bunch of problems, or a bunch of stories, or a bunch of tickets, or a bunch of bugs, and we're making progress. And the flip is true. You see a burn up chart where you're just accumulating work, and it's not getting done and you really get stressed out, right? So part of what we've done is we've taken all this data, we can put it all on a dashboard and that's great, but we've also made it, um, you know, we're, we're taking advantage of the structure that we have where we have vulnerabilities that are correlated across tools. So, you know, as you saw earlier, if the same vulnerability is being detected by two or three different security tools, we put it in one place. And then we'll show you how broad of an impact is that issue, right? Is it one service? Is it 50 services? Is it every EC2 instance or you know, GCP VM that you're, you're managing? So you can make better decisions. And that's where you know, this view lets you take like an entity-centric view. Show me all of the components in my platform or in my team or like however I've organized things and stack rank them by how bad they are at you know, risk. Mm -hmm. And right here at the top, uh, this this particular demo account has a mono repo for all its services. So Demotron Public is actually the source code repo that GitHub is scanning. And you can see like it's got a ton of vulnerabilities because it's every application that we deploy. So right. I could go in and I could look specifically at, hmm, what are all the vulnerabilities in this repo in our source control system? And I can look at those and I can prioritize those. And this goes back to something that Yoram mentioned earlier, which is some, you know, the the high ranking, the high profile, um, you know, bugs are the ones that get everyone's attention. Oh, log for J. Oh, like, like like all those. Of course, they get everyone's attention. But if you have one single application or method that uses that critically, you know, very, very visible thing, but you have a hundred other things that use this medium thing, that bar will show you, you know, I'm imagining that top bar not having the red, only having the gray, okay? Mm -hmm. But it has it to such a large extent that as someone trying to manage work and manage teams, that would immediately float up in my mind to say, uh-uh, no, I know that there's nothing critical going on. Again, back to the marketing team. You're doing a great job squashing those critical bugs, but you have 9,000 medium and small bugs. Let's do, you know, not bugs, uh, you know, vulnerabilities. Let's deal with those now, you know, and it's easier to visualize it that way. It just, and, and, yeah. And if, if you, you touch know, to a little be honest, bit. It, it depends on where you're at as a company, right? Yeah. Some companies are just really explicit. Like we don't have, we never get to the mediums. So our focus right now is patching criticals and highs. And okay. that like that might just be the status quo for now. I think it's a little bit like, you know, don't repeat incident work when you've had an outage versus paying down tech debt. Uh -huh. and, and, tech debt and, is always a, just a long, slow burn. It takes a lot of time to address. And there are going to be times when you say, you know what, this quarter, like we just don't have time to do much about it because we had a big incident and we have to patch that or because we have this you know, feature or this business case. But then you do have to have awareness of that stuff so that you can make progress over time. And let me, let me uh, 
with a little bit of more, another perspective on critical trend highs. Um, yeah, statistically, mediums are kind of the where, where the action is when it comes to trade actors. Uh, but let's say I have a, a humongous uh, hole in, when it comes to security as a critical one, but then I have segmentation, and really nobody can get into that vulnerability because I have it somewhere else in the platform. So I, I kind of secure that part, and yeah, it's going to be red for a while, until I go and address it, probably it's gonna, I can size the impact of the business when I address that, but then I'm gonna go and shift and, and focus on the medium ones because I know the big critical one is segmented and put away in a box uh, on a different part of the of the stack. So that's that's a different perspective from, depending where you are on the, on the company, but uh, the, right. the important part here is that the observability that allows you to achieve that level that. of, exactly, a level of awareness and informed decision that you can drive from. That, that was the point I was going to make. Is it, it, we're not here today on Changelog. We are not espousing the, you know, you should be addressing only critical, you know, medium and, you know, and highs, or you should only do this, or blah, blah, or people who don't do this are idiots. Or like, we're not saying any of that. What we're saying is that you make your decisions based on real data and real insight and real ability to understand what's happening on the ground in your environment, not based on gut and guesswork and, you know, all the rest of it. That's, that's all, that's the only flag that we're planting. Um, okay. Jonathan, Yoram and I were cutting you off multiple times. What else? What else is there? <laughs> well, so you know, I'll just say, like, maybe this is just obvious to everyone listening, but from what Yoram was saying, it's about context, right? You know, we talk about mitigations in vulnerability work because often there's stuff you can do to buy yourself time or to, you know, it's kind of like the time when you, you hack in some pretty bad but effective bit of code or solution to a problem just to get it done with for now, right? And now you've got yourself some tech debt. I think mitigations are very much like that in the security world in context of, is this thing buried deep in our backend systems where it's almost not even reachable by humans? Or is it literally, you know, accepting connections from the open <laughs> internet, right? That context yeah. matters a lot to how pri high priority something is. Um, but okay, what else I want to show you? Um, I don't want to spend too much time on demos, but the power of taking this observability approach, creating a real relational data model, if you will, between the components and the vulnerabilities and the classification of the vulnerabilities is that we start to up level the work. You know, it's one thing for me to go in and say, okay, show me all the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. I could filter this and I can say, you know what, I'm actually just going to focus on cloud resources. So show me the stuff that is like AWS is yelling at me about. Right. Because we've we're all in on AWS in this particular demo environment. But this is true of any cloud posture or infrastructure security tool. It's going to tell you about stuff like, hey, root user on one of your accounts doesn't have hardware multi-factor auth. That's a best practice you should implement. And that's something I could go and say, okay, I should probably go track down which accounts have root users that aren't using auth best practices. But then when I look down here, I notice there's a bunch of highs that are connected to 95 entities. These are impacting uh -huh. almost 100 cloud resources. And it's, well, what is this? Okay, EC2 instances from Amazon's best practices should not have a public IP address. It's a security risk. Uh, okay. You think? <laughs> it's a Sorry. thing, right? <laughs> you should be using load balancers. You should be using, you know, other technology to uh, isolate your VMs from the public internet. Uh, and right here, I can see there's a whole bunch of servers that are not isolated from the public internet. So and that's, this is you know, this is not a critical one, by the way. This is high, right? Which is right. which is huge, right? I just I just want to mention that. And what this says to me is like whoever set up this environment just didn't think about that in their security right. architecture. They didn't think about bastion hosts or you know app load balancers or ELBs or whatever else it is. Um, and so we've got all these servers that have publicly allocated IP addresses. We should really like that's a that's a task that I can very quickly look at this data and identify as a big risk win 
if we go in and do that. Uh -huh. And I could say, you know, I've got like a hundred EC2 instances that were provisioned wrong on this, on these two things, right? They're using the old version of the instance metadata service and they have public IP addresses. And I can send like a one line Slack to our security team and say, hey, just noticed this team has all this stuff, these two issues. How important is that for us to fix and how quickly do we have to get it fixed? And that's a super high bandwidth conversation to have with a security team when you're coming to them doing it instead of them sending you a spreadsheet and saying, you have to do this work on these 95 EC2 instances. Like I can come to them and say, hey, I noticed this and I've synthesized it. Right. And that's, we're also doing that with the third party libraries, right? We talked about CVEs and log4j and open source dependencies. This is the, just like my favorite feature of everything we've done here. On one tab, I can get a list of every single third-party library in use by the runtime apps that I've instrumented with APM. And it automatically rolls up, what versions of Rack am I using in all my apps? Well, I've only got one version deployed out there. Well, mm -hmm. that version has five CVEs in it, right? And there's 21 different APM entities using it Oh, and by the way, there's 52 total instances deployed. So, you know, any given service could have multiple instances. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's a thousand. So I can really quickly assess, like, what's the overall impact here? And as I scroll through this, I also see, like, Active Record and Sinatra. So clearly we've got, like, a bunch of Ruby apps. There's 21 in all these cases. So this is probably, like, the same set of 21 apps that all have a bunch of outdated dependencies. But, you know, I can find out, like, are we actually using log4j? There you go. <laughs> there you go. Okay, this is where I have to pause the, the, the uh, just for the audience and just say, we did build a demo that, ha that was rife with problems because we had yes. to show you how it looks. <laughs> I don't want anyone walking away from this episode <laughs> thinking, holy cow, those folks at New Relic, they just have a whole stop problem. This is a demo, it, folks. Yes. This is just a demo environment. 100%. <laughs> Sorry. This is a simulated company environment. This, this is, is just... That's a great, great disclaimer. Hey? <laughs> Yes. environment because they just show like uh, for the past five months no months nobody has addressed some uh, uh, vulnerabilities if that's not true we right. do address right, them right. right away yeah absolutely <laughs> uh for the record new relic has a comprehensive vulnerability management and security program uh, Thank you. There, <laughs> <scroll> <laughs> legal the, legal the, made us say this yes. yeah okay so anyway but, anyway but sorry this, i just like you know, this is a toy environment, right? We're looking at like, I mean, you know, a hundred servers is not tiny. Uh, a dozen, two dozen microservices is like, that's enough that you don't know everything. Yeah. But the power of this is that it just took me like five seconds to ask the question, are we using log4j? We can do that across tens of thousands of services in the Absolutely. same five seconds. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there are some environments where you type that in or you type in, you know, any any old library that's pretty common in use, like um, where are we using Tomcat, right? Okay, we got like a bunch of Tomcat dependencies floating out there. There's one service. There are environments where these numbers are 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, you get that message that says, hey, brand new, critical vulnerability was just released, how badly are we impacted? It could take you a week to track down an answer to that question. And we can get you jump started on that discovery in like seconds. And then you could, you know, you can download this list as a CSV and say, I have an audit of everything New Relic can see that is running log4j and what version it's running and how many of those CVEs it's impacted by. And that is just amazingly powerful. Yeah. And on the flip side, you know, if we take it back to the individual service, we can do some really clever stuff with the fact that we're doing this library based assessment too. In a service, if I click into vulnerability management and click libraries, again, I can see all the third party libraries that this service uses. I can see what version we've got deployed. And I can see if there are known vulnerabilities in that version in that service. And we're going a step further 
And we're looking at all of those security bulletins and identifying you know, what versions of these libraries have a fix in them. And then we're recommending to you our best recommendation on what version of the library you should upgrade to. And what we're doing here is we're looking at, for this library, you know, it may have ten, five vulnerabilities that are fixed in different patch versions. And we're trying to do our best to give you like the least risky upgrade that addresses as many of those vulnerabilities as possible. So we're not going to just say, go get the newest release of this library and tell you to upgrade to that. We're going to say, if, you, if we can get you to like a 2.2.x patch release and that mitigates everything, we'll recommend that, right? Because that's the least risky change for you. But in this case, you know, the fix for some of these vulnerabilities requires you to go up a major version bump to 3.0. And so we're going to show you that. So this is where we, we go from that huge list of CVEs to a list of actions yeah. that have measurable impact on your security risk. And and as a as a dev, that's you know, okay, great. You know, this is vulnerable, this is vulnerable, this is vulnerable, the end. You know, in the in the bad old days, security would sw again swoop by and drop this steaming pile of, of findings and like, okay, now I have to research what to do. We've done that legwork and said, nope, you need to go here. I'm not saying that it's sunshine and roses. Sometimes upgrade to 3.0.4.1 carries a whole lot of implications about refactoring, a whole lot. I'm like, there's there's work behind them them digits. But you know that doing any less isn't going to fix the problem. No, and not only that. Sometimes it's, it's like I get these reactions when we run this demo. Some of our customers, they say, well, duh, of course I have to upgrade. That, that will fix everything. Like, <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, we will have some other information that you can act on today to mitigate the risk. And, and that's what the, the actionable intelligence that we provide here in New Relic with this vulnerability management tool um, it's important. It's like it's, we're not just pointing the obvious. We're trying to um, get you somewhere where the risk is not as imminent as we were before, and you yeah, can and, measure that. And I'm going to push back against that. That you know, upgrade. It's not just you have to upgrade. You have to upgrade to at least this version. And I'm sorry, but there are many customers. I'm not talking about edge cases. Many customers who are running legacy systems that are you know that they can't upgrade for whatever reason to a newer operating system, or they can't move it into a virtual environment, whatever it is, and it needs to be you know like they. This is a showstopper that, you know, 3041 may mean, you know what, we, we put it off, we put it off, but we now we have to do something about this because we can't just upgrade. The, the whole, again, that cascade, that house of cards has to be swapped out, but they, they know that that has to happen. It's not, it's not so duh. Right, yeah, and, and not and, only that, it's, it's the, the collection of information. Again, do we provide in this in context uh, so they can make the right decision for themselves and their environment. Yeah. But uh, before they have to just really go and dig this, dig this thing up and then see what they can do about it. Right now it's front and center and at least have uh, a way there to solving the problem. And, and yeah, it's not always like, duh, I have to upgrade. But of course, that's, that's kind of half the solution. Right. And, you know, beyond that, like there are companies that provide long-term support for old versions of open source, right? And you know, in this case, we're looking at a Rails app. Like there, there is a company out there that will sell you security patches for you know version two of Rack. And this, the way we've got this data pulled together, actually makes it very easy for you to do an assessment of if I've only got one or two services that need this upgrade. Maybe it's worth just rolling up our sleeves and getting the work done. But if we have hundreds of applications impacted by the same issues in the same, you know, top one or two libraries. And those teams are, you know, variously underwater with other priorities. Maybe it makes sense to go out and buy some paid support so that we can get, you know, those backports. And there's a business case to be built there, right? It will take right. us X number of days of dev time and, you know, Y amount of opportunity cost to do all this patching. Or we can go and get this vendor to give us a point release. And then, you know, that reduces, you know, 10 weeks of effort to three weeks of effort and it's worth it. And it saves everyone time and we can be confident we've mitigated those issues. Nice. 
Okay. Is there more? Is there anything else you want to show today? Uh, I think I think we've exhausted my bag of goodies for now. <laughs> okay. For, All for right. now. For yeah. now. Yes. Yes. That I'm yeah. more excited. We're always working on exciting things and new things to help our, our customers and other engineers in general uh, do their best work. Uh, so yeah. yeah, there's absolutely more to come. And, uh, and a point today, that I... Yeah, for today, exactly. And a point I like to make on Changelog especially is that, you know, the work at New Relic really is never done because as we release a new capability or an upgraded feature out into the wild, people use it and they use it in particular ways. And the feedback is incredibly valuable to say, oh, I love the way you did this, but if you only had such and such, or I really thought it was going to do this thing, but it doesn't, what would it take to do this thing? That's what drives us. That's what gets us up in the morning on Monday, excited to come to work and to, you know, really help people solve their problems. So as you, the audience are interacting with vulnerability management that give us that feedback, those, those opinions and ideas, because that's what drives the next iteration of this. Um, and that takes us into what I affectionately call the lightning round of changelog. You know, any final thoughts? I'll start off uh, with one very important uh, thing that we all need to understand, which is that running is a very good thing for other people to do. And Jonathan is other people <laughs> in this particular case. Security, on the other hand, look, how I'm doing this. Security is something that everyone needs to do. But how we do it, how you know, how we do it varies. It's best when we're able to structure security work so that it naturally fits into the other work we're already doing. So it becomes just another piece of what we're doing. And the last piece that I will say in the lightning round is it's not just duh. Security, it's not just duh. It's gonna we're gonna put on a t-shirt, the whole thing. Um Yoram, Yoram, what do you what do you have as sort of final thoughts and ideas? Final thoughts. So yeah, knowledge is power. And uh, we, we bring these to, to the front and center. Um, the other thing is uh, vulnerability management is part of our, the one observability platform that New Relic offers with a bunch of new features every day that we're pumping out. Uh, we can spend another three hours talking about them, but we won't. Um, go check it out. It's, it's part of the platform, and uh, you, should, you should get into this uh, security practice as a daily practice because it's what we're supposed to do as humans, the, the, yeah. the risks down. So... Um, good luck with running, Jonathan. That's the only thing I'm gonna say. <laughs> okay, Jonathan, <laughs> you can run. You can run and bring us home. What are your final thoughts? <laughs> I'm feeling a little more nervous about this running thing than I did at the beginning of this episode. It's terrible, man. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I am. I am really happy to be here talking about this. I hope that this conversation, you know, inspires people to think a little more, maybe a little more critically about the status quo. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I know security can feel a lot like just a compliance process that gets handed to you. But we, you know, we, the, the engineers, right, the, the engineering leadership, I, I've been one, um, we can, you know, we can have an impact on this. We can bring ideas and solutions and partnership to this process. We don't just have to sit here and wait for security teams to dictate how we solve these problems. Nice. All right. Well, I want to thank both of you for carving out time out of your day and this release to, to talk on Changelog. Um, good luck to everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I also want to thank everyone watching. Uh, there is an overwhelming choice of video content to binge on these days. We all know that the latest Netflix something has dropped, you know, so there's all sorts of things to do. And we want to thank you for spending some of your precious video watching time with us. If you've enjoyed the show today, please don't forget to subscribe so you can get notifications when new episodes drop. For New Relic Changelog, I'm Liana Dotto.